Welcome to the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis and to our second annual regional economic conference. My name is Neil Kashkari. I'm the president of the Federal Reserve Bank here. And since coming to the Fed in January 2016, I made a priority of getting out around our region as much as I can. And that includes Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and Northwestern Wisconsin. And two things have jumped out at me almost everywhere that I go. One is that a lot of rural communities are concerned about their futures, that they've got declining populations, their young people go to the cities, and a lot of folks who are living in rural communities in our area say, what's going to happen to our towns? A second thing that I hear a lot wherever I go are businesses saying we can't find workers. The unemployment rate nationally is now 3.7%. I oftentimes hear businesses saying, I just can't find the workers that I need. Now, I'm not entirely sympathetic with that view because I've been saying you should try paying more and you may be able to attract workers. But nonetheless, the un as the unemployment rate goes down, there is a question about where the workforce is going to come from. And if you look at the sources of economic growth, they come from productivity growth and they come from population growth. And our population growth rate has been declining as it has been in many advanced economies. We're just having fewer kids. And so when you think about the declining populations in rural America and you think about workforce challenges, you realize that immigration does have a role to play potentially in helping in both of those problems. I've visited towns in our region, Worthington, Minnesota, for example, where for 20 or 30 years they've embraced immigration as a source of population growth and as a source of workforce growth, and they've had tremendous success doing it. And so the point of this conference here today is to explore the role that immigration is playing in and around our region and the role that we think it needs to play going forward. Now, I'm thrilled that we have uh, Senator Ron Johnson here as our keynote speaker. Last year at our first conference, we were uh, honored to have Senator Heidkamp from North Dakota in our region, and today we're honored to have Senator Johnson. Senator Johnson and I have talked about immigration a number of times as I've gone to Washington, D.C., and the important role that immigration potentially can play in America's economic growth, and we're really, really looking forward to exploring that with Senator Johnson and with all of you today. So I'm going to invite the senator here to kick us off. Uh, senator Johnson was first elected to the United States Senate in 2010. He is chairman of the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee and also serves on the Budget, Foreign Relations, and Commerce Science and Transportation Committees. Prior to his service in the Senate, uh, Senator Johnson helped start and was CEO of a plastic extrusion manufacturing business in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Uh, he's a proud native originally of Mankato, Minnesota, and he attended the University of Minnesota where he earned a degree in business and accounting and most importantly met his wife Jane. He is now resides in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. After Senator Johnson's opening remarks, I will join the Senator and ask him a few questions myself and then we will turn it to all of you uh, for an open question and answer session with the Senator. And just a reminder that we're live streaming this, uh, so when it comes your turn to ask a question, please wait for a microphone so people uh, who are watching at home can hear you. Uh, so with that, please join me in welcoming Senator Ron Johnson. Thank you, Dan. Well, thank you, President Kashkari, and, and just thanks for putting on this conference. Uh, this immigration issue is incredibly important, and I'm happy to participate here uh, this morning. Uh, let me start off, uh, just quick show of hands. How many here are veterans of our military service? First of all, th thank you for your service. Uh, how, how many saw the Saturday Night Live, uh, I guess, repair job with Pete Davidson and, and uh, Dan Crenshaw. If you haven't, go on YouTube. It's, it's, a, really, it's a really cool moment. Uh, it was a sincere apology offered and a genuine acceptance of that apology. And we need, we need more of those moments. But I thought one of the things when Dan Crenshaw kind of summarized his, uh, his remarks, he said, you know, we, we really do as veterans, we appreciate when you say thank you for your service and thank you for your service. But start using the term never forget, never forget because uh, we can't forget the, the million Americans that lost their lives defending this marvel of an, of an American economy, this, this marvel of an experiment of, of self-governance. Uh, a million people died, and we never can forget that. So I just want to kind of start, start out that way uh, day after Veterans Day. Um, let me ask you a, another question. Uh, sh show of hands. Uh, how many people think the federal government is efficient and effective? Okay, we got one. How, how many things pretty broken dysfunctional? 
Okay, I, I, I agree with you folks. Um, I, I've literally asked that question to tens of thousands, primarily Wisconsinites, but other Americans. Oftentimes when somebody raises their hands, I'll, I'll get the, the comment, well, I get my Social Security check on time. So, yeah, the federal government has become pretty efficient at spending money, but uh, not, not really efficient at actually balancing the budget. But the point of my asking that question is when it is so commonly known, again, tens of thousands of people, maybe a couple hundred people have raised their hand thinking the federal government is efficient and effective. So by and large, we view the federal government uh, not in real good graces. We're, we're, we don't think it's particularly efficient, it's particularly effective. So the question I'm asking is, why would anybody want to grow it? Why would you want to outsource, for example, your compassion to such, such a dysfunctional and broken place? Why do you want to outsource your problem solving? You know, kind of getting back to that, uh, that Saturday Night Live moment, that, that coming together, the sincere apology, um, that forgiveness. What I think we ought to concentrate as, as, as we address all these enormous problems facing this nation is the areas of agreement. I mean, that's what you do in business. If, in order to succeed in business, you have to per tenaciously pursue areas of agreement. I've got a product, I want to sell it to you, you want to buy it, okay, we agree on that, now you can haggle over the price. Well, as Americans, I truly believe this, and I think it was demonstrated with that Saturday Night Live moment. As Americans, we, we really do agree on the overall goal, the overall objective. We want a safe, a prosperous, and secure America. Quite honestly, that's a universal goal of every human being on this planet. So as, as we start talking about these enormous challenges facing our nation, facing our globe, I think that we're better off starting with that acknowledgement that we're all human beings, we all have the same hopes, the same desires, the same types of aspirations to be able to raise a family in safety and security with some measure of prosperity. If, if we start there, we're going to, we, first of all, you start the process of finding areas of agreement, and I and one that thinks success breeds success. So what I'd like to do, and then leave as much time for, for questions and answers, I, I have a manufacturing background, you know, an accounting degree, I'm, I'm a numbers guy. But uh, being in manufacturing, you solve an awful lot of problems, almost on a daily basis. There's a process for going through the pro for, to, to solving a problem. You know, root cause analysis, problem definition, uh, gathering the information, to do both of those things. And then, you know, once you've done all that hard work, you establish an achievable goal. Then, then based on that achievable goal, now you start designing solutions. Well, in Washington, D.C., the reason it's so unbelievably dysfunction, dysfunctional is they start with a solution. You know, some piece of legislation that, I don't know, somebody cooked up in either in a campaign or some staff members who don't have a whole lot of connection to the private sector, it's not directed toward an achievable goal. It's completely divorced from reality. Again, I've just kind of described the dysfunction. Now, when I got there, you know, I, I saw that glaring problem, just a, of a lack of a problem-solving capability within Washington, D.C. Um, so one of the first things I did, because I really ran for two reasons. Uh, I realized Obamacare was not going to live up to its promises, and was, we we're going to have to do an awful lot of repairing the damage done by Obamacare. And that's not to say that we, a lot of people didn't get health care and you know, got insurance, but we're all paying for it, and premiums have skyrocketed in the individual market. And then the first chart here, the debt and deficit. Uh, you know, before I did this chart, and we actually got this in, in, our, in the CBO and in, in the budget process as the 30-year budget window, everybody was talking about unfunded liabilities. And let's face it. Nobody really understands net present value or really what that means. They're, you know, $100 trillion, $200 trillion, take your pick. So I, I thought, well, people can understand about a 30-year time frame. So I, I just wonder, what is, the, what is the projected deficit over the next 30 years? And so CBO started projecting, and, and the, here's the results. You know, this is the most recent amount. The, the lar largest one a couple of years ago when we anticipated interest rates actually being higher for a longer period of time was $128 trillion. But right now we're talking about over 30 decades, it goes from 12 to 30 to 67 trillion dollars over those three decades, 109 trillion dollars, and just to relate that to something, 134 trillion dollars is the entire net private asset base of America. Now again, you can say, I mean, are we at our debt load right now? I mean, obviously not, because we haven't seen interest rates spike, but at some point in time, America is no longer the world's reserve currency, 
and we may see some kind of bursting of this debt bubble. Nobody can produce it. My guess, or can predict when it's going to happen. My guess it's not going to be particularly pleasant. I guess I could control the... Here, here's how that breaks down, by the way. It's pr pretty simple to describe. About $18 trillion in benefits exceeding revenue from the payroll tax in Social Security, $39 trillion in Medicare and health care spending. The rest of that's about $56 trillion interest on the debt. So if you're trying to solve a problem, you have to first define it. And if you don't want to pay your creditors over the next 30 years, $56 trillion, you have to address those looming deficits in Social Security and Medicare. But nobody wants to touch this with a 10-foot pole, so I'm, I'm not holding my breath. I just love this picture. Uh, the, the fiction of the Social Security Trust Fund, this is it. This is the trust fund. It's a four-drawer file, and it's, what is it, Parkersburg, West Virginia. So I, I just like throwing that up just so every, I mean, you're all bankers. You understand what, you know, this is just an accounting convention. But the American people actually think there's, there, that money's been put away for, for them. It, it isn't. It's been spent. It's gone. And they're just relying on their kids working uh, a lot harder than they ever probably had to to, to really fulfill the promise of Social Security. Um, one, of the, one of the problems that I started describing right away when I got into Congress, and by the way, th these charts are kind of a trip down memory lane. These are just charts I produced over the last uh, eight years as a United States Senator, but uh, this used to be a series of charts describing, you know, really the ineffectiveness of the federal government addressing the war on poverty. And I would start really with the, uh, the green and the blue lines there, showing how in, you know, from the mid-50s to the mid-60s, where our economy was booming after World War II, poverty rates, the number of people in poverty were dropping precipitously. But they were still too high, and so, you know, Lyndon Baines Johnson said, well, we, we've got to engage in a, a, a war on poverty. And so we've spent about $19 trillion on the war on poverty over the last uh, five, six decades. And my question is, did it work? And you take a look at, you know, number of people in poverty increased. I mean, that makes sense. Population increased. So the better metric is, is literally the poverty rate. It pretty well flatlined after we engaged in a $19 trillion war on poverty. Uh, one of the things I would put up there, which I think is a very bad societal metric, is number of uh, birth, births out of wedlock. Uh, again, I, I think the foundational uh, unit of any successful society is a strong family. Uh, we've seen families you know, certainly weakened. And I would say there's been a little bit of a correlation in terms of dependency and a, and a culture of entitlement that has not been helpful in terms of family strength. Uh, this is a fun little chart uh, when you talk about the cost of college. You know, our, our children, we've enticed them to collectively incur about $1.4 trillion of, of student loan debt. Uh, and I was talking to uh, President Kashkari earlier today. You know, the Federal Reserve can really be helpful in providing information that's you know, very respected, unassailable. The Federal Reserve Bank in New York, for example, issued a study, along with Northeastern University as well, you know, taking a look at the effect of federal government involvement, their, their pouring of, of money into higher education, and what the Federal Reserve Bank in New York found, that for every dollar the federal government, will say, invested into higher education, tuition increased 60%. If you do the math on that, I did this a couple years ago, about $2.1 trillion has been the total grants and student loans. 60% uh, of that is $1.4 trillion. I think that's more, more than just a coincidence that... Our kids have been left holding the bag for all that good intention. But had tuition just increased the rate of inflation, you know, it started out a little under 1000 bucks, It would be about $7,200 today or in 2016. Uh, instead, it's about 19500 Something caused that. And, you know, I always point out there's two areas of our economy where we've really largely taken out the discipline of, of, the, of a free market and competitive system. It's in healthcare, care. It's in education. And we're not particularly pleased with the results. You take a look at where there is no productivity gains, it's in education. We are still, K through 12 and in college, we're still pretty much on a 19th century model of education, yet we have all this massive technology improvement, productivity gains throughout the rest of our economy, except those two areas, except that area in particular is, is education. Healthcare. Obviously, the big, big debate, my, my own root cause analysis, I mean, the root cause of why uh, health care costs so much is, again, we took the free market discipline out of it when we started separating the consumer of the product from the payment of the product. And here's just a chart that shows that. Back, back in the, right after World War II, 68 cents of every health care dollar was paid directly by the patient for the service. 
Back then, about 32% was paid by somebody else. You know, l largely back then, this is the, the beginning, back in the 20s, of Blue Cross and then Blue Shield, you know, the, the beginning of insurance, a third-party payer. But then government got involved big time in the 60s with Medicare and Medicaid and now Obamacare. And you can see the results. Now, 89 cents of every health care dollar is paid by somebody else. And consumers are only paying 11, 11 cents. So when, when you're a consumer of any product, if you don't know what it costs, and by the way, the providers don't even know what it costs. You ask a doctor, you ask any of your health care providers, they don't have a clue. There's just some account in their office dealing with an accountant in some insurance agency. It's not surprising that the cost of health care has dramatically outpaced the rate of inflation. This shows, and again, this is kind of my point, how we don't know how to solve problems in Washington, D.C. This is a more complicated graph, but this is the one I was trying to show my colleagues uh, during the whole health care debate. Uh, if you take a look at the blue line, that, those are actual premiums. And you can see where we were for a single male, uh, 200 and, what is it, 232 uh, per month for, I think, a male of 40 years old. The tread line back up to 2026 would be about 303. Now, what Obamacare did, because, and here's the faulty architecture of Obamacare, it's forcing a very small percentage of the American population, 5 to 6 or 7 percent, to bear the full cost burden of covering people with pre-existing high-cost conditions. Rather than spreading that over everybody like high-risk pools did in states, now we're asking a very small slice of the American population, who, by the way, pays for their health insurance with after-tax dollars, a gross inequity. But the result of that, then, is premiums just skyrocketed in the individual market, $476 per month. The Senate bill, now if we would have just taken that, the red line would have been the, the trend line based on CPM medical. The Senate bill based on Social Security didn't solve the problem, didn't bring us back down to where it should have been, the baseline. It actually increased premiums for the first couple of years, dropped them about 30% on the baseline, grossly inadequate. This is one of the reasons that the thing never passed because it wasn't a very good bill, nor was the House, the House bill was actually worse. I just love this graph. It just shows the futility of trying to uh, tax success or punish success. Now, this just shows the, the top marginal tax rate versus the effective rate for individuals. You can see the effective rate has been pretty constant, right around 18%, whether we have a 91% uh, tax rate or 28%. You know, my own preference would be get that as low as possible. Now, you're always going to have some kind of deductions that and, and some progressivity. So you're always going to have a higher marginal tax rate than the to total effective rate, but you're far better off. And you know, we're, we're getting kind of close to where we need to be, somewhere in the 30%. Uh, what is pleasing when you take a look at public opinion polls, you ask most Americans, you know, what do you think the top marginal tax rate ought to be? Like, like 80% is, say, says 30% or lower. Maybe 60% says 20% or lower. So the American public really doesn't want the federal government tax success. That's just politicians. Okay, we talked about... You know, I just went through a lot of problems that we have not solved. Uh, this whole conference now is on immigration, so I just have my last four slides uh, is going to be on kind of the immigration problem. I'm chairman of Homeland Security, so we've held something like 30 hearings on some aspect of border security. One of the things I've done often in, in my opening comments on, on, uh, on the committee hearings is I would just go through the history of the laws and how many people in the country illegally after the passage. Now, prior to the 1986 amnesty bill from uh, President Reagan, uh, which I thought was a you know, pretty good attempt if we would have followed up by actually securing our border, uh, prior to that, we were thinking somewhere two to three million people were in this country illegally. Uh, they, they thought there'd be somewhere between a half and a million and a half people take advantage of the amnesty, but 2.7 million people took advantage of the amnesty. And you, you can see the ongoing lack of progress. You know, all these bills either have a really nice name that says it's going to solve the problem or they have a pretty significant component that was supposed to fix this problem. But you can see we go from 3.9 to 3.5 to 6.3. I mean, you can read, read the results. This is classic Washington, D.C. right here. Pass a bill, put a good name on it. I could add Patient Protection Affordable Care Act. Never fixes the problem. One, one of the reasons we can't fix problems is we're pretty immune to, like, real information. Again, lack of that problem-solving process. And Washington, D.C. doesn't really like information because they really don't want to be held accountable. I mean, these agencies just do not have metrics over anything. It's, it's really quite astounding. They don't have common accounting systems. Trying to get any information out of, of, out of agencies, whether they're you know, an administration of your party or, or not, you just can't get the information. If you don't have information, you can't solve problems. But anyway, 
here's a lack of progress, obviously, on an immigration issue. And by the way, if, you, if we, and I want to solve the immigration issue, but until we fix our horribly broken legal immigration system, because of all the illegal immigration, you're not going to be able to set up a really good 21st century uh, immigration system for America. This is a pretty interesting uh, graph right here. The only way we ha can measure how many people may have come into this country illegally is by the number of people we apprehend. Nobody knows how many people came in and were apprehended. So this is just a, a surrogate for the number of people coming to this country illegally, kind of you know, telling you what the problem is. The reason I like this chart is back in the 50s and 60s, we actually had a guest worker program that I would argue worked pretty well. It's called the Bracera Program. Now, the unions hated it, and so they killed it off. And you can see the result afterwards is illegal immigration started to skyrocket. But prior to that, with that Bracera Program, we had circularity of immigration. It makes an awful lot of sense. You know, so many, so many of the, the Mexicans coming in to America were coming in to work for two to three months to pick crops in California, and then they'd go home. The wage differential was, back then was something like five, five or six or seven to one. So, they could, so a Mexican national could come up to America, work for a couple months, earn a year's worth of salary, and go home. That was a system that worked for everybody. Now, maybe it didn't work too well for American workers that were maybe competing for that labor, but to me, there's a pretty simple solution for that. You can see we've had a pretty good fall off of apprehensions in the last, uh, let's say, decade. That's because I would ar argue NAFTA. You know, we have a lot more success in the Mexican economy, which is a good thing. And as a result, we have fewer Mexicans. Now the problem really is, is individuals coming from Central America. Uh, oftentimes, I say the, the root cause of our unsecured border is America's insatiable demand for drugs. It's our insatiable demand that has given rise to drug cartels. Uh, so when you go down to Central America, they talk about two problems in those governments. We, we destroy the public institutions down there because of the drug cartels, but corruption and impunity. I first heard impunity. What? I mean, I know about corruption. Well, impunity is the drug cartels operate with impunity, and so does everybody else as a result. I mean, when you destroy law enforcement, so now you've got MS-13, uh, you've got those gangs that are run extortion rackets, an unbelievable brutality. We bear an awful lot of responsibility for that, which we should own up to. Last two charts are something I've used repeatedly in my, in my committee. Uh, I know the folks on the other side of the aisle don't like this, but here's just the reality situation. Uh, this is talking about unaccompanied alien children coming to this country over the last decade. And you can see in, in uh, 2009, 10, and 11, we had three to 4,000 unaccompanied children, by the way, take a very dangerous journey through Mexico. They, they ride a train they call the Beast. The lowest estimate I've heard is, is young women, 30% of them are sexually assaulted. I've heard as high as 80%. You don't want to send your child on that journey. You don't want to be incentivized. We don't want to incentivize people to do that. But in 2012, again, out of compassion, you know, President Obama issued the Deferred Action on Childhood Arrivals. Now, it doesn't apply to anybody coming afterwards. That just applies to the dreamers. But it was used by the coyotes as an incentive and then the reality situation is once an unaccompanied child comes to America for a variety of reasons, variety of laws, they get to stay. We, we've, we've removed less than 3.5%. They use social media. They're communicating with other young people, other families. It costs, by the way, about a year's worth of salary to employ a coyote to take your kid up here. And again, some of them are put into sex trafficking, involuntary servitude. It's, it's not a pleasant situation. Uh, but you can see more than 200,000 unaccompanied children have now entered this country illegally and are here because of really a broken, broken system. And the same thing happened with family units. Along with that same dynamic, after DACA, we had a lot of family units coming in. So the Obama administration actually started detaining children with their families. Somebody took them to court because you can't legally, you can't uh, detain a child for more than 20 days before you return them or release them to HHS and into some kind of situation uh, in the U.S. And so somebody sued the Obama administration for those detentions, and the courts reinterpreted uh, the Flores settlement to include children with their parents. And so we, the Obama administration didn't want to separate children from parents, so we went into full catch and release. You, you came in as a family unit, and we just processed you and released you which, of course, led to even, even greater numbers of people. Last month alone, 27,000 people came in as a family unit because they're exploiting our system. 
So again, I, I just wanted a quick run through kind of my charts. I, I just try and describe a problem you know, with a picture as succinctly as possible as the first step in solving any problems. And I guess with that, I'm happy to answer your questions. Pete, I'll join you. So, Senator, thank you for that um, background. And, you know, when you look at uh, a lot of the budget, let's start where you started with, which is the budget and the uh, unfunded liabilities that we have going forward. A lot of those programs are funded by current workers paying for current retirees. And as our birth rate has gone down, those, pro those programs go into the red. And so just think about it from an economic perspective. Given the, the facts that you laid out there, What's our roadmap? I mean, how do we reach consensus to say, you know what, the fact of the matter is the U.S. economy, for the sake of economic growth and for the sake of paying for all of these programs, we just need more people. How do we get there? Well, again, I'll, I'll go back to this a number of times. We need the information. And this is where a Federal Reserve can be so important and play such a, a great role, is laying out the birth rate, la laying out those population projections, laying out how you know, an economy is two things, right? Capital combined with, with, you know, financial capital combined with human capital. If you don't have enough human capital, you're not going to have a growing economy. And the number one component to the solution, I don't care what problem, I mean, we've touched on a few of them. The number one component of a solution to all the problems facing this nation is economic growth. You have to grow the economy. And if you don't have enough uh, human beings, if you don't have that, that human capital, you have no chance of, of growing the economy. So there's no, no policies, no tax cuts, uh, no deregulation is going to make up for the fact that we simply don't have enough workers. Our birth rate is lower than it's ever been probably much in our history. We're going to need a, a vibrant legal immigration uh, population. And we're, we're, we're a nation of immigrants. And I don't have the stats off the top of my head, but the number of, of Fortune 500 companies uh, that have been started, or be, you know, CEOs are CEOs are, are of first and second generation immigrants is extremely high. They they bring vitality to our economy, and they've come here this, for the same reason all of our ancestors came in here was for the opportunity that is really unique to America. So again, I, I think we just have to, we have to preach the story of why legal immigration is so important, why we should transition our legal immigration system to work. Not, not neglecting the fact that we want to keep families intact, but you know, we do need to be careful about expanding that so much at the expense of bringing in enough people to, to really grow our economy. And if you look, uh, you know, historically, immigration has been a big source of competitiveness for the U.S. economy. And we've, we're not perfect at it. My parents are immigrants. My wife is an immigrant. We're not perfect at it, but we're better at it than anybody else. And if you look at Japan as an example, Japan's demographics are even worse than America but they're so culturally averse to immigration, they're trying to subsidize fertility to pay Japanese young families to say, have more kids. It's a really, really tough road to hoe. And so now they're trying to look at, is there some way we could embrace immigration? But it's tough for them. And, and it, you know, one th we also have to make sure that the number of people we let in can be assimilated. I mean, you have a real problem now in Belgium and France, you know, a pretty large Muslim population, they're in pockets, they haven't assimilated the, to, to the, uh, to the culture and to the country. Um, listen, people can maintain their, their cultures and their, their heritage, but the people we let in this, that we grant citizenship to or legal permanent residency, need to embrace our rule of law, need to embrace really what America represents. It's, it's, it's a nation based on, on principles and, and an idea of individual liberty and freedom. And when you travel around Wisconsin and talk to other business owners like yourself, uh, you're, you're an entrepreneur and a manufacturer, do they get it? Do they understand that immigration is going to be part of their workforce for the future, or are they nervous about it? No, the, the, you know, I, I, I've been in manufacturing for 30-some years. For the last 20, I couldn't hire enough people. And there's not one manufacturing company I visit a lot in Wisconsin over the last eight years that I visited that can hire enough people. So we have a real worker shortage in this country, particularly in the trades, particularly in manufacturing, because one of the reasons we tell all of our kids, you've got to get a four-year degree. Get $30,000 in debt. Well, what does that tell our young people? First of all, that there's something wrong with going to the trades or manufacturing. Nothing could be further from the truth. You know, we also do pay people not to work, which is not real good. So, uh, no, business people definitely get it. It's the first issue I found out when I, you know, I decided kind of late to run for Senate in about May of 2010. June in, in Wisconsin, but you may not realize this is dairy month, so you go to these dairy breakfasts. First overall issue that I was confronted with was farmers coming up and saying, we've got to fix this immigration system. We need the immigrant workers. We can't milk our cows. 
So, I mean, you, you, if you've never seen it, by the way, there are already machines that completely automate milking. It's, it's absolutely amazing. I saw one when I was in California. Uh, anyway, this is a, a huge automated dairy farm. And the miracle to me was all the cows just lined up. They knew when it was time to get milk. They knew yeah, when they were oh, full. They lined up. They're on the carousels. Machine, they're they're on a big ride. carousel. Yeah. They walked out. It was something I've uh, never seen that before. Um, what about skilled immigration? So we know, and I've made, when I meet with uh, farmers around our region, they say the same thing that you just said. What about the high-skilled immigration? When I think about large businesses in our region, especially in the Twin Cities, they want as many of the graduates as they possibly can get from University of Minnesota or University of Wisconsin. Where does high-skilled immigration fit into this? First of all, let me say, I, in the spectrum of skills, I, I would view high-skilled also as really hard worker. So we need the full skill sets, and there's just no doubt about it that we need high-skilled workers. Uh, it makes no sense to me that when we have a worker shortage, America would be, our, our factories should be producing high labor content product. I mean, it makes no sense. We should be doing high value, value added content, and that's going to require a, a higher level skill for us as well. So, I mean, there's, without a question, we have to do that. When, when we graduate kids out of our engineering schools, I don't care what country, I mean, there, there ought to be a, what they call a green card attached to that. Uh, we need to retain the best and brightest minds from around the world in America. Got it. Well, why don't we start turning to the audience? Uh, if folks have questions, we've got microphones on either side. Just raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. This gentleman over here, a microphone is coming to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator and uh, President Kashkari, for this conference. Um, I'd like to pick up on that skilled immigration part. I'm a director of um, the Lyle School of Engineering Executive Board at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, and virtually 100% of the grad students there are, in fact, immigrants. And as I chatted with them recently at a recent board meeting, um, overwhelmingly they said our goal you know, is to stay here in this country for a few years as long as we can, but then we're going to have to go back to our home country. How, can we fix our immigration system, at least in part, by um, taking a divide and conquer and, uh, piece by piece and say, you know, we've got to be able to attach a long-term citizenship associated with uh, graduating from one of our engineering schools? One word that I would like to outlaw in Washington, D.C. is comprehensive. We, we, as you saw, we just don't, we don't do comprehensive very well. I, I'm much, again, I'm, I'm a manufacturer. One, one of the things just in bread and you is continuous improvement, just step-by-step -step improvements. I'd love to see that. I, I think there's a large consensus in, in Congress to make sure that the high-skilled immigrants can stay because it makes no sense to send them home to benefit you know, the economy of our, of our global competitors. It's, it's crazy. But... You know, just like you know, we, we passed the DHS reauthorization bill. We haven't reauthorized the, and we did it through our committee in a very nonpartisan way. So let's keep the areas of disagreement out. Let's concentrate on the areas of agreement. But in the United States Senate, just one person can object, and there's just no way we we're going to pass that common sense authorization uh, because somebody wanted to bring in the more divisive issues. So again, I, I, I my technique has always been focus on the areas of agreement, do it step by step. Hopefully, success will breed success. So that's exactly going to be my approach. I, we we passed a bill, or we're working on a bill right now to call the Families Act to address the Flores settlement, and I'm just going to try and work in good faith to try and do it. But that's ex that's exactly what we should do. Just step by step. What's one of the easiest problems to fix, and let's fix it. Okay. But again, po politics is we're, we're a very divided nation. You know, the demagoguery, the rhetoric is not helpful. Others up here, Mari. Mike's coming to you. And do me a favor, uh, sorry I didn't ask this gentleman, could you just introduce yourself when you ask the question, please? I'm Mari Pillai. I'm, I work at General Mills here in Minneapolis. Um, so my question is on both ends of the spectrum, the manual labor. Have you guys considered, or have you all considered, reintroducing the Bracero program? That's one. And at the skilled level of the immigration, or at the top end, there are other countries like Canada and Australia, for example, that have a different system than we do for visas and so on, a point-based system. So have, as in your committees, have you looked at all of those and considered what pieces of those might be applicable to us in the U.S.? It's, and we are looking at kind of across the globe different, different models. It's, it's a hearing I, I do want to hold. We have limited time to do so. Uh, but I think, it's, again, it's gathering information, you know, what's an approach that's rational around the, the, the world, 
and it kind of helps justify things you want to do. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a pretty controversial subject right now, birthright citizenship. Uh, you know, that was passed in 1868, and obviously for very good reasons. Uh, times have changed, and un unlimited, and I want to say unlimited birthright citizenship, I'm not sure it makes a whole lot of sense, because we're, we're rewarding people coming to this country illegally. There are, there's the phenomenon of, of birth tourism. So again, to, to curb the abuses, to end those incentives, which I think is the, the number one thing we have to do to fix our broken immigration system, is end those incentives, end those rewards, you know, we should be taking a look at that. In terms of the Becerra program, you know, that was you know, ended be, because of a host of reasons. Probably wouldn't be real smart to bring that one back, but I did introduce a piece of legislation in this Congress, I'll reintroduce it, which is a, a guest worker visa system, state-based guest worker visa system. You know, my bill would have uh, granted about half a million visas, 5,000 visas per state, and then the other half of that, the other 250,000 divvied up by population. States could enter into compacts. And if, if one state didn't want immigrant labor, fine, you know, don't have any. We can allocate those to somebody else. The half a million, to, to, in my mind, is probably inadequate. Uh, but again, we, we need the metrics to find out you know, what, is, what is the right number of people come, bring in this country legally based on you know, where they need to be put to work, you know, where, where there are voids and, 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 and real uh, requirements for, for workers uh, so that we're not depressing wages. I mean, that's one part, part of my bill also would have allowed states to, you, you can set minimum wage rates for different industries. You, you, you know better in your own particular state than any, any wise, one size fits all uh, model out of Washington, D.C. So again, I, I introduced that, uh, worked with the Cato Institute on it. We have a number of co-sponsors. Uh, we have a number of people that uh, support it within industry. But I'll tell you, it doesn't, right now it doesn't have a chance. It doesn't have a chance in, in this Congress. Uh, maybe, maybe moving forward we can. Uh, it's going to require an, a, big, a big lift politically. It, from my standpoint, it's going to require an awful lot of lobbying from different groups. You know, right, now, right now we have the, pro, you know, the really hard pro-immigrant. You have the really hard anti-immigrant. We really need business community, the NFIB, you know, coming together and stepping up the plate on, I would say, on free trade, but also on, on immig a sensible immigration system. And how about the points program that she mentioned? You know, Canada has that program where they, if you have certain skills in certain industries. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, I mean, some kind of merit-based system, you know, how you actually do it. Uh, again, I would much rather see it governed by the states as opposed to a federal program because federal you just can't administer it. To, you can't really recognize the variation in, in all the different regions of the country. So that's why I'm, I'd really target more toward states administering that stuff and coming up with those incentives themselves. Others? Hi, my name is Michelle Rivero. I'm with the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs for the city of Minneapolis. And I have a question. First, I have a comment. I am very grateful that you recognize what the push factors are for Central American children from Guatemala, Guatemala El Salvador, and Honduras, um, and the level of impunity uh, that, that um, gang factions uh, have there in those countries. I am troubled by the characterization of individuals coming to the United States as people taking advantage of the system, because people who are coming to the United States from those countries and are seeking asylum are legitimately trying to apply for an immigration benefit that our law permits. And I'm wondering if you can comment on the national conversation relating to individuals who are applying for asylum, which is enshrined in our sure. U.S. laws. Thank well, you. first of all, I think it should be incumbent on them to come into this country legally. And so that's going to be waiting probably in Mexico, and we're going to, I think, support uh, Mexican authorities to provide housing, that type of thing, but come legally through the ports of entry. Uh, right now, as of October, we have about 1,600 individuals coming between the ports of entry illegally. Uh, we have another 314, I think, coming to the ports of entry. Uh, in fiscal year 2018, the one we just ended at the end of September, it was, it was about 1,400 immigrants, or people coming to this country per day. You know, so we talk about these caravans, a couple, a couple thousand people. Every couple of days we have a caravan-sized group of people coming in either illegally or without proper documentation. Um, the hurdle, the, the, you know, the, the bar that they have to uh, achieve to claim asylum is very low. 
Uh, you know, they have the credible fear, credible fear standards. So that sets up an almost endless appeal process. So, I mean, this, is, this becomes really complex. My point is, I think we need to set reasonable asylum standards. Uh, by the way, you know, we have murder rates in some American cities as high as some of the Central American countries as well. Um, but that's, a, that's another, another issue. But it's got to be a legal process, and, and we need to fix the system right now. We have to, I think a goal of our policy should be to reduce the flow of people coming to this country illegally. So that would mean to increase the flow of people coming in the right way, standing in line. I mean, let's face it, you know, we're dealing with right now with a flow from Central America, but, you know, basically three countries. You, know, you might start throwing in Colombia and Venezuela, maybe even your Brazil. Um, there are 190 some countries in this world. You've, you've got a population of about 7 billion people in this, in this world. I would guess probably hundreds of millions, if not a billion or more, would like to be in the United States. We can't accept them all. So we have to set some reasonable asylum standards here. And right now, our, 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 we have a very low bar of letting people in, and then there's an endless appeals process. You know, there's, there's no certainty, uh, and, and it is an exploitation of, I think, really bad law. We need to make our law more certain. Other questions? Up here in the front. Uh, oh. Well, thank you, Senator, for your coming, President, for having the conference here. Uh, the question that I have Could you is, introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Marcos Ramirez. I'm a, I'm a lawyer here in the Twin Cities. Thank um, you. And the question that I have is in regards to Venezuela. I'm originally from Venezuela, and now with the situation that is happening there, I see more Venezuelans coming to the state every single day as political asylums and meetings and why not. And now there are, there are allegations that the Venezuelan government, in fact, uh, participating in giving money to people in the caravan to come here. So it, it seems to me that is a national threat now to the United States. Uh, what is the conversation that you all have in Washington about Venezuela? I uh, look. It seems to me that the only person advocating in in order uh, for for uh, uh, help in Venezuela is Senator Rubio. But uh, that's what I wanted to to ask you. Thank you. Well, let me start with one of my concerns of the U.S. education system where we're cranking out so many young people that are embracing socialism. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you want to exhibit A of why socialism doesn't work, the most recent example is Venezuela. I mean, it is, it is a tragedy, a human tragedy, that an oil-wealthy nation like Venezuela uh, was taken over by, by communist Marxist socialists, okay? And they've destroyed the country. I mean, they've utterly destroyed it. What can we do? I, I, I'm at a loss. I mean, we, we can certainly support, uh, you know, freedom fighters, but, I mean, they're being crushed right now. Uh, somebody suggesting invasion. I mean, it's, it's a horrible situation. But it's, it's also being, you know, our, our detente with Cuba certainly hasn't worked out in terms of improving their behavior. They're obviously, uh, Venezuela's modeled. It's being, in many respects, probably run by a lot of uh, Cuban operatives as well. So... I think what the U.S. has to continue to do is, first of all, lead by example, promote our values of individual liberty in, in a, you know open, plur pluralistic, and democratic system, and I guess I guess help countries where we think we can help. But I, I'm at a loss. I don't know what you do with Venezuela. It's it's a horrible situation, but it, it's a it's a horrible situation because the wrong economic model and the wrong governing model was brought to bear there, and we need to learn from that, and unfortunately, we're cranking out uh, a lot of young people that are embracing that, which I think is, you know, that's crazy. So speaking of the economy, I'm gonna just intervene for just a second. As you think about, you travel around Wisconsin all the time, uh, how is the economy? What's your own outlook for the Wisconsin economy, for the U.S. economy? Well, first of all, it's extremely strong, um, and, and for two reasons. First, a huge attitude shift. You know, in Wisconsin, when Governor Walker took over, one of the first uh, phrases he used, as, as well as Lieutenant Governor Clayfish, was Wisconsin's open for business. It's so much more than a slogan. It's an attitude change. It's like, hey, we're going to do everything we can as, as a government to, to incentivize business risk-taking, to make Wisconsin an attractive place for business investment, risk-taking, uh, business expansion, job creation. And I would say, I would argue that's exactly what President Trump did when he took over uh, you know, the federal economy. We first stopped over-regulating. 
I, I can't tell you, I mean, to me, that's the most significant thing this administration has done. I mean, the t tax bill could have been far better from my estimation, but also was important. But just the fact that business people, and again, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm one of them, I've been there. The fact that for four years, businesses could, could realize that I'd have to look over my shoulder and look for a new regulation that could put me out of business or force me to, you know, I've talked to so many small banks, they had to fire loan officers and, and hire compliance officers. So that attitude and policy shift, stop over-regulating, we actually reduce the regulatory burden, which, you know, according to some estimates, about three different estimates, place the annual regulatory burden of the federal government at $2 trillion per year. $2 trillion, okay? I mean, that's such a huge drag on economic uh, activity. Now, nobody's gonna argue we don't need some regulation, but also the fact that we made our tax system far more competitive globally. I mean, I would have done it totally different, better, but uh, it, it was important. It's, it's a better, it's a more competitive tax system than we had two years ago. So no, I, in Wisconsin, we've had less than 3% less than unemployment for the last eight months running. We're at 3.7%. When I went to U of M, had uh, Dr. D Dr. Heller was my Econ 101. Um, you know, back then, full employment was always turned 4 to 5%. We are so below that, which again talks about why why this conversation is so important. You know, with with our, with our you know young people probably having on average just a couple of kids, it's just not it's not a robust enough uh, uh, birth rate to grow an economy the way we need it to grow to pay off a hundred nine trillion dollar projected thirty year deficit. So no, the economy I think is doing well. Thank you, gentleman in the back. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Senator, and thank you uh, for this conference. My name is Pascal Mukocha. I am a local immigration lawyer. And one thing that troubles uh, a lot of us, uh, both as an immigrant, as an immigration lawyer, is uh, we have low-hanging fruit, DACA. More than 600,000 kids who were brought here, uh, I mean, some of them when they were year two, we've seen a lot of them. And everybody across the board agrees that those kids, they are not going anywhere. They are as American as those born here. And it seems to us that it doesn't make sense that our elected leaders cannot have simple discussion to resolve that issue. It seems to be one of the most simplest issues, as, as complex as immigration is. DACA seems to be one of those that is a no-brainer. Why can't we do something about it? Well, it goes back to my first question, how many think the federal government is efficient and effective or, or capable of solving problems? You know, I thought what President Trump proposed was eminently reasonable. He was actually going to take care of about 1.2 million uh, dreamers, which, by the way, when you take a look at the, the family units, the, the children, that's another 600,000 individuals we're not even talking about right now. I mean, it's gonna, that's a problem for the future, I guess. Um, so what President Trump basically proposed was let's, let's provide some kind of legal status for about 1.2 million people in that dreamer status. And all we asked in return was end the diversity lottery program, which by the way, we grant a million people, more than a million people, legal remnant, resident, per, or permanent legal residency every year. It's a very diverse group, very diverse. You don't need a separate diversity lottery. Uh, he also asked uh, let's start making it more merit-based like the Canadian system. And then give me some funding for better barriers, which we do need. I thought it was an eminently reasonable proposal, but you know, he was turned down, which I thought was very unfortunate. And the political reality is, you're not going to. The only way we get we get some of the fix, some of the solutions, so we just don't incentivize more people. And right now, that's the biggest problem. Worse than not having good enough barriers is our the incentives and rewards we provide for illegal immigration. The only way politically we can get some of that fixed is to get in exchange for dealing with the dreamers. And there's political reality. So I, I think we've, we've, on our side of the aisle, and certainly with President Trump, he's, he's shown his willingness to address at least 1.2 million of the dreamers. I, I think we need to address a larger number personally, but we don't have the, the full metrics on that. And all we're asking for is some pretty reasonable fixes for part of the broken system. And again, we're, the, the answer from the other side is no. Remember, remember, you know, again, not to get too partisan political, but President Obama, when he ran as a candidate, said he was going to fix the immigration system in, in his first year. This is when he had a large majority in the House and a filibuster-proof Senate, and he did nothing. So my concern is, on the other side of the aisle, they think this is a, a argument that, that uh, you know, favors them. 
Uh, I think there are probably people on our side that it's an argument that favors Republicans. I, I hate the entire argument. I just want to fix the problem. And I agree with this gentleman earlier. Let's kind of do it step by step. But you have to recognize the reality of the situation. You know, one step on this side is going to probably require some matching step as, as somewhat of a, a compromise to get the thing accomplished. Other questions? Yep. Hi, I'm Paul Valerat, and I teach at the University of Minnesota Business School. So my first question for the senator is, when are you coming back for a class reunion? Uh, but maybe I should ask a question about immigration. I wonder if there's any message you heard about immigration in last week's midterm elections. No, uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, I mean, last week's election was pretty, mu pretty much a mixed bag. Uh, I mean, take a look at Wisconsin. Uh, you had President Trump come in and, and really energize the vote in, in a lot of the rural counties, but he also more than energized uh, you know, votes in, in Dane County and, and Madison, Milwaukee, and, and that was the, the determining factor, quite honestly, in the U.S. Senate race and, and the governor race. So it re really was a mixed bag. Now, you know, Lena McConnell's always talking about the, the perfect time to address some of these really big problems is when you have divided government. Uh, you'll need people of good faith on both sides to actually want to fix it. I'm, I'm not real encouraged what we're hearing out of uh, the, the incoming House leadership, uh, you know, 80-some different investigations. Uh, it's always been my concern is, you know, with them taking over the majority, the Democrats taking the majority, it's just going to be about investigation and talk of impeachment and really not about governing. Other questions? Uh, uh, oh, go ahead, and, and then we'll come up to the lady in the front. Uh, Alexis Miller with Advanced Masonry Restoration. Um, my question is more out of curiosity. Um, well, first, let me explain that I do come work at a small biz, private small business where majority of our workforce is union. So my thought now, and if I ever were to step in shoes as an owner, is the underf underfunded liability there. With that being said, you had mentioned in the beginning of your speech about the program where, I can't remember the name, and you said um, people could come in, they worked for a few months. Okay, that's what it would be. And you had made the comment that that program did no longer work because of the union pushback. I'm just wondering, is that why were there other causes, and could we see a future where Maybe the unions could work together. What could be done? Maybe sure. to go down that route to also help support and bring in workers in what I like to think the skilled trades. Well, let me say you know, again, back in the 50s and 60s, I'm sure the unions had pretty good arguments about some and probably widespread, widespread abuse of immigrant laborers. I mean, it's probably not a real proud chapter in our history in many respects. And so I'm sure there's, there's a fair amount of abuse, and they wanted to see that abuse ended, as well as always concerned about how bringing in migrant workers would depress American wages. You know, from my standpoint, that should be relatively easy to fix by you know, setting some, some basic prevailing rates, wage rates in different industries so that you know, we don't depress American uh, wages. So to me, it's, it's a relatively simple fix. But again, you need to have people goodwill recognize the problem that we need more workers. And by the way, you know, I've, I've been talking to President Trump on, you know, in terms of tr the trade and the tariffs and all that type of thing. And I think this administration is recognizing the reality that one of our big problems is the fact that we don't have enough workers, which is a good sign in terms of moving forward to, to fix the problem. woman here in the white had a... Hi. My name is Kelsey Waits. I'm a student at the Humphrey School. Um, I have had a slight issue with some of the things you've been saying regarding securing the borders and, and people coming across, because I feel like that perpetuates the stereotype that that's where all of the undocumented immigrants are coming from, rather than looking at the statistics that we've seen from the Homeland Security, that anywhere from half to two thirds of undocumented immigrants are actually immigrants who have overstayed their visas. Now, it's beyond- about, It's beyond, about 40% is the- 40%. So how do we work with those immigrants to allow them to continue staying and working here legally and contributing to, to the economy if we're talking about trying to find this balance between workers and bringing people in? Well, again, I've always felt that uh, if you have, again, when you finally solve the problem, whether it's dreamers, whether it's people that are, that are overstaying the visa, and again, it's, the best estimate is about 40%. Um, Employers will happily pay the fine. 
I mean, it, it does aggravate me to no end when, you know, you propose something like that and, and the right still shouts amnesty. No, it's not a amnesty. If, if you're actually paying a fine, you, you know, acknowledge you've done something wrong. We're a nation of laws. You know, we need to enforce laws. But also have to recognize the reality that you could have. And by the way, there's a study put out by Yale professors, kind of, kind of try to calculate how many people in this country illegally a different way. Their estimate was somewhere between 16 and 30. And so they kind of took the midpoint and said about 22 versus the 12. So, but no, nobody really knows. It, that's not helpful to anybody. I don't, I don't want to see anybody living in the shadows. And I, I don't want that large a illegal immigrant population in this country. So you know, have, have people self-report, have them pay a fine. You know, but that's going to be a, that's a heavy lift politically to, to accomplish. But I'm, I'm all for it. You know, this, just, this is a very unacceptable situation we have right now. Looks like we got time for one more question. I saw a lady here in yellow, or at least your sleeve is yellow. <laughs> Can you pass that down? While we're waiting, too, I just I do want to say, I hope I come across as being very pro-legal immigration, because I am. And, I, and, and hopefully you understand I really want to solve this problem. Hi, I'm Jane Grotman. I'm the executive director at the International Institute of Minnesota. So in terms of legal immigration, I just wanted to ask you, or say that Minnesota has um, really benefited from being a very welcoming state to refugees, and the economy has really benefited from having them here. And um, so, uh, and in fact, the Trump administration in their first quarter of the administration um, commissioned a study that showed that it, refugees, and by the way, that's a humanitarian program, actually are a $6 billion net uh, gain for the U.S. economy. So it's not just a regional benefit, it's a national benefit, the program is. So the Trump administration, so in the history of the program, the average number of refugees allowed into the United States has been 80,000 if you average it over the, over the decades, four decades of the program. And um, so the Trump administration has the lowest number of refugees allowed in the U.S. in the history of the country. This year it's 35,000. And last year we didn't even admit 20,000 refugees to the U.S. So I'm wondering if you're being an advocate for that program because it is a legal program that's been very successful. And I'm wondering if you're being an advocate at the White House for the refugee program. You know, I, I just met with uh, Mark Green, who's head of USAID, and uh, USAID is primarily designed to respond globally to natural disasters. You know, somewhere in the order of 75 to 80 million people, I think is the figure he used. Right now, they're having to respond to probably about 125 million people, you know, close to starvation, and it's almost all man-made. So th there's no doubt about there's a huge need in the world. Uh, they're all, they're, they're, there are millions of people who want to come to this country as, as you know, legal refugees or also granting asylum, which, by the way, there is no limit on, you know, based on treaty in terms of people we grant asylum to. Uh, so my only question is, how do, you, how do you make that a legal process? How do you make sure you set the, 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 num the, number, the, the number so that we can actually assimilate it? And again, it's all part and parcel of the same thing. You can't just separate well, refugees, it seems like just 80,000. But, but we've got, you know, hundreds of thousands coming in illegal, granting asylum, plus you have the, the million that we grant permanent legal residency to. So you have to look at it as in total as opposed to moving every little bucket and say, well, this is just the problem right here and we need, just need a lot more of that bucket. Well, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming out to our conference today. We've got a great rest of the sessions, several panels, people from all of our region uh, coming here to speak. I also want to thank everybody. I looked at the attendee list this morning and we have people from across the political spectrum, across ideological spectrum. And I want to I appreciate everybody coming here and participating in a very thoughtful, respectful conversation. And please join me in thanking Senator Johnson for coming and joining us today. Thank you. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.